What's going on? RGI James back, baby. Welcome, everyone, listeners and viewers, to the regular GI Joe podcast. It, I am super stoked today, uh, Mike, because our guest today is a good friend, dear friend, veteran. I've been knowing him since 1998, showing our age there, but we were stationed together. But now I could also add to the title, author. So my boy Marcus Simmons here is actually the author of the Unapologetically Masculine Masculinity Without Toxicity, which is, by the way, an awesome read, man. So Marcus, I'm glad. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the podcast. Appreciate you coming on. So tell us, Marcus, uh, give us your narrative, man. Uh, I know, like I said a little bit, we we were together in 98, but just give us your narrative, you know, what you did, uh, you know, the Air Force and everything, where you're at now and whatnot, what's going on with you. Oh, man, a lot to tell. So, of course, 98, we were stationed together at Spain Dallum Air Base. Um, I did 10 years in the Air Force uh, for us forced out with some health issues. Um you know, it's been a wild ride, man. Yeah, I was a bioenvironmental engineering technician, and the funny thing is, I'm still at today. I was, I'm a I'm a civilian oh, uh, awesome. employee. Work on, work on, yeah, I work on Lackland Air Force Base, doing the same thing I was doing back then. I just get paid a whole lot more money with a lot of less BS. Uh, but we'll talk about <laughs> that in a minute. Just how uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of ready to walk away from that too. You know, it, after a while, it, right. gets, it gets to be the same old, same old. After twenty, what it's been twenty five years, not twenty six years. Same old, same old. But uh, Air Force was a great ride, man. But my transition out of the Air Force was, it was rocky, man. I'll be honest with you. It, it was it was different. So I got to the point, uh, and I got to the point where my knees were really giving me a hard time. And I, I was had old football injuries and things like that. And it just, it got to the point where I, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. They would swell up, all kind of stuff like that. And then, so I, I was at Wilford Hall one day and, uh, this guy comes in, man. It was, it was like this guy was like a, like an old one of those old colonels. Like he needs to retire, like today. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, you know yeah, like yeah. cigarettes, like this, <laughs> throwback, right? And he comes in and he sits beside me on the bench, on the on the bed. And the doctors never do that, never do. He sits beside me and he's like, "Listen up, Sarge. Me and you gonna have to have a talk." And I was like, "Okay, you know, so you, these knees you got, they ain't gonna take you to retirement, man." We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to, we're wow. gonna have to put you out the pasture. He used those words, put you out the pasture. <laughs> like old yellow over here. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I'm shook. I'm shook, man, because like my whole career by telling me, hey man, you and your path to chief, you're gonna be this, you're gonna be that. You know, you won all these awards, all these accolades. And I and I was just I, my mouth was just open. He just pats me on my leg and kind of walks out. That was it. <laughs> so yeah, they're like, well, we're gonna MEB you, do all this stuff. Well, mm -hmm. I got pissed. You know, just back then, I was young and 20, what, 27, 28 years old, man. I'm like, this is it. I'm thinking the Air Force is my life. You know, I mm -hmm. came from a small town in Mississippi, born and bred. That's all I knew was hard work and to do the right thing. That's all I was taught to grow up. Right. Be a good person, work hard. That's what my dad put in my head. And that's what I did. And it served me well in the Air Force. And I'm thinking, okay, I can make a career. So I can retire, have a good life. Not so, man. Life had a different spin on it. So, long story short, they were going to me beat me, but I was so I was so hurt and so I felt so pushed off that I actually got out before they could me beat me. I just got out, so because my contract was up. All Looking right. back, I was so prideful and arrogant, man. I talk about that in the book, you know, because right. I had my whole personality wrapped up in that uniform. Everything, and I heard I heard you talk about that too, Mike. You know, like my whole personality was wrapped up in the uniform. It was wrapped up in the mm -hmm. accolades and Sergeant Simmons and all this other stuff that that really doesn't matter. And so I find myself out outside of, out the Air Force, 2007. Put it in perspective. I had three, I had two kids at the time. I have my, my oldest son, and my youngest son, and uh, my daughter was born literally a month after I left the Air Force. She was wow. born in the Hall. They still had to pay for the. They still had to do the do the uh, birth because I was still yeah. considered active. Right. And I got a brand new baby. I ain't got nothing. I got no degree. I got nothing lined up. You know, everything was banking on the Air Force, and the Air Force was like, see you later. Yep. 
so I'm I'm shook, man. I'm like, I'm I'm distraught. You know, I'm I'm trying to work. So I, I take a job with a, a a neighbor of mine had his own business. And he needed a manager for his job. Well, okay, I'm thinking like like Mike was talking about like all the skills we have. I can manage. I, can, I know how to manage mm-hmm. people. I know how to do admin stuff. I know how to deal with people, relations, all that stuff like that. Turns out this dude was a crook, man. This dude was wow. <laughs> and this dude scam artist twenty six thousand dollars. Yeah, twenty six thousand dollars. This dude was making a million dollars of profit, a million dollars a year, and he paid me twenty six thousand dollars a year. Wow, for seventy hours a week is seventy hours a week busting my hump. And he kept promising me, "Hey man, when things take off, I'm gonna take care of you, take care of your family." I got a newborn at home. Mm-hmm. I got a newborn, a three year old, and a five year old at home. Wow, and I'm making twenty six thousand dollars a year. So finally, VA kicks in, and we're doing a little bit better. This dude did not like the fact that all the, we had 60 workers, 60 employees between he, between San Antonio and the Valley, 60 employees. And these these dudes would run through a brick wall for me, man. And he didn't like it. He didn't like the wow. fact he's the only owner. You know, they won't listen to him. They won't listen to me. And right. Instead of him being happy that I got a manager that's doing the dang thing, he wanted to sell me my name. You know, it's all this crazy stuff. So he ends up firing me. The first time in my life, I ever been wow. fired from anything. I've never been fired from it. It shook and it, it hit me again because, like, you talk about that pride, man. Like, I, you know who I am, man. Like, you, <laughs> you, you, get, that, you get that, like, man, you know who I am, man. I'm, right. I'm Sergeant Simmons. I make stuff happen. I'm, I'm NCO of the year, Aaron of the year. I'm this guy. Yes. This guy. See you later. So I'm home. I'm home. Yeah. Dude. I am home with my daughter. I got no job, no degree. No money coming in, just my VA. My wife is working every day. And look at wow. me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm as masculine as they come, man. I'm I, I male pride. Right? I'm sitting here mm-hmm. at home, busted up knees, busted up pride, busted up bank account. I got nothing. My wife gets up and goes to work every day as a banker. Yeah. She's a veteran also. Right, right. And I'm just, I'm looking at my life like, what happened? All this is in the span of probably a year, year and a half. And I went from being the cream of the crop to being a stay at home dad. Let, dad now, let me just, ins- let me insert this here. Marcus, when I met him in 98, sharp, like he was always uniform, was professional, always on time at work, got the airman of the quarters, got the airman of the years. Like he was on point. You know what I'm saying? And, and at that young mentality, you know, we were 18, 18, 19 coming in that yeah. was like like we talked about me and mike talked about before how the culture has changed but we were yes sir no sir yes ma'am no man volunteering yeah. all the time you know trying to do as yeah. much as you can because we were in the mindset that when we joined that was it the air force was it for us like we wanted to do careers you know what i'm saying like marcus to the, he had the potential to be cheap and that's how we saw him like we saw him going big time in 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 the air force rankings and everything else so I could I could relate to your, your what you, you you know your frustration because again, like I told Mike before, I said my only blessing right now that I'm not able to have to find a job right away is because I'm retired. You know what I'm saying? So I'm yeah. able to be comfort. But again, trying to transition to trying to find a civilian job is, is scary to me because you know the interview process and everything else. So I I could un- totally understand like. How you already like, yo, this, how is this happening to Sergeant Simmons? Because Sergeant Simmons was somebody, you know what I'm saying? In the yeah. Air Force, you were, yeah. you were the go-to guy in your job and everything else, like I said. But go ahead, continue with, with your wife working all the time. Yeah, and, and you're right. You know, back then, like, we were kids, but we, we, we got up and went to work. That's what we did. Mm-hmm. We partied hard, but we got up and went to work. <laughs> I got the stories about Izzy, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't drink. I never have. I'm not a drinker. Never have. D D. But <laughs> <laughs> these types of stories, man. But maybe we can get that on YouTube. I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, we have some, some definitely have some stories, man. But so the wife's working, you know, and mm-hmm. it, my pride is hurt. I'm hurt, dude. Right. I'm hurt up, man. I didn't put on like sixty pounds. You know, I you know I used to be a gym rat, basket man. Is you kill the kill on the basketball court, flag mm-hmm. football? We play. I'm gonna put on like 60 pounds. My, I'm on pain all the time. I'm on opiates. I'm on tramadol. Oh wow! I'm popping tramadol. Yeah. Like, like Skittles, man. Like it's like me. It's like eating a bag of Skittles. I'm right. hurting. And so, I'm trying to figure something. I'm on my computer for six, eight hours a day trying to get a job. Trying to get a job. Trying to get a job. And one day, I talk about this in my book. I just broke. 
I literally just mm-hmm. broke. I collapsed. I fell on the floor, crying uncontrollably. <clears throat> Couldn't get myself together, man. Just crying. Lord, help me. Just, just, just bust it, man. Because I, I, my whole thing, my whole personality was just gone. I didn't even know who I was anymore. You know, and uh, it was a moment. And so I finally got myself together, set up, set up, and kind of leaned against the wall. And then it clears day, man. I, I, Mike, I know you're not a religious man. Izzy, I know you're you're Catholic, but uh, for me, it was a moment. It was I'm like, Pentecostal. You yourself... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pentecostal. <laughs> and, uh, it was just like you got to get yourself together. You got to reinvent yourself. That was the thing. Reinvent yourself. Get yes. up. All this fear. Like I, I grew up in a small town in Mississippi. School was not a priority. You know, I was a good, always a good student, but I was afraid. I thought I was dumb. I always believed. I always believed I was dumb. And right. that was so secretly, you know, how, how I saw myself was like a, a well-spoken dumb dude. Like I thought I had fooled, I thought I was fooling people because I actually felt like I was dumb. And so he was like, you got to get back in school. So I went to school and uh, that was 2008. Went, went to school, started, started going to school. And I realized quickly that, man, I could do this. This is easy money. Wasn't even six months later, I get an email from a, from a company that says, hey, uh, we're looking for engineering technicians like you for a job at Lackland. And I was like, huh, really? So I, I think it's a joke because I you get those spam emails, right? Right, right. So I emailed them back, <clears throat> flick, and sure enough, she calls me. She's like, hey, uh, first the first and last time I ever heard this in my life, we need you. Name your price. I've never, that's wow. the first time and the last time I've ever heard that. Right, right. <laughs> so I threw a number out there. She's like, okay, no problem, cool. So I'm getting paid crazy money to go back and do five level work in a career field that I've been in for 10 years, man. It's like taking candy from a baby. <laughs> and so we started to get our finances back together and I and I'm, I finished college, finished my bachelor's degree and things are starting to go good. 2012 comes along and something that never happens in my career field, like people die at their desk in my career field, like civilians die at their desk. No, no lie, they found people dead. <laughs> Straight up, this guy, <laughs> yeah. guys, he just not gonna come to work one day, and they offer me a job. So I get a, I get a job as a, as a civilian, a, a GS job, which is like gold in my career field. Uh, Mike, I'm not. What did you do when you were in, Mike? What, what, was, what was your special? Uh, so I did like what is it, materials handler. So I was uh, there for materials handler for the Air Force, and then when I worked for the VA, I was a uh, 2210, so an IT guy. Gotcha, gotcha. So like in our in our career field, a, a civilian spot is really small career field. Mm-hmm. Only about three thousand people. So you get a you get a GS job and you're your goal. And so twenty twelve we get the job, everything's going good. And so then I decided, hey I wanna, I wanna really figure out what I wanna do. It's like you were saying on the earlier episode, you weren't happy. You got the GS job and I was just like, man, this you know, I'm, I'm in it but I'm not in it, you know, and I'm mentoring these young guys and uh really really trying to, you know, be a part of the team. And so I, I'm just like, I'm going I'm to go back to school. I want to be a counselor. I want to be the be what I always wanted to be, what I thought I couldn't be. I want to be a counselor. So I started a master's degree program to be a marriage and family counselor. The day before I start my program, I wake up in the morning, get ready to go to work. Is you read in the book? And uh, I'm looking in the, at myself in the mirror because, you know, I'm a good-looking guy. So I'm looking <laughs> at myself in the mirror. He always was like that, Mike. He always was like that. Always. Yo, so let, let me retract a little bit here. So Marcus and I and another real good friend of ours, we decided to get an apartment Ooh. together in Germany. Back in those days, it was called the Airman's Attic. So they actually had mm-hmm. these apartments to where if Airman wanted to live away from the dormitories, you could do that. So Marcus came up to me and our other good friend and was like, hey, guys, let's, you know, let's get the apartment and then let's get out of the door and just because we all clicked very well. I'm command post. He's bioenvironmental. And our other friend was a personnelist. So we all mm-hmm. really clicked really well. Like, I don't know why, because me and Marcus were more from like we knew street and everything else. And our friend was just the friend, you know what I'm saying? Like, he just from Pennsylvania, from Pittsburgh, but, you know, he was more like 90210 Beverly Hills, you know what I'm saying? So, but for some reason, yeah, <laughs> to the side, but for some reason, we, we meshed so well, like, we just, it just synced. I don't know what it was. So, we ended up going to the Airman's Attic. And let me tell you, before you see Marcus the way he is now, he had hair. 
He wasn't bald. <laughs> so, so Mark has always had the do-rag on, trying to get the waves in his hair. And, and Marcus was very fit, like, because he used to play, I believe, football, correct? You play football back in high school and everything else. So even, even in Germany, always in the gym, and he and I, we would play basketball all the time. We were like Stockton and Malone. He was my center power forward, and I was the point guard. But, dude, he would always wear do-rags, make sure he looked good and everything. When we would go out, wear proper shirt, creases oh, in yeah. his pants. He would put creases yep. in his pants and everything. When we would Definitely, go, he man. always made cologne, <laughs> always made sure he looked good. So I, I know what he's talking about. I know exactly <laughs> what he's talking about. But let me ask you this, Mark. Where where was um your wife during this time uh, when you were going back to school? Was she out of the military already? Where, where was she at? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So my wife got out uh, after our, after the birth of our, when she got pregnant with our second son. She got out in 04. So that, I was at Herbert Field at the time. Uh, spec out space down there in Florida. So mm -hmm. I was there when she got out and I was like, Hey, I got you, babe. You come on, get out. She's having some health issues, you know, carrying my big old babies. All of my kids are over, well over huge, uh, eight pounds, <laughs> <laughs> huge kids. So and my wife's a little lady. She's only five, four. Right, right. I see <laughs> <it. laughs> so she struggled, you know, and, uh, and she was having right. problems with her job and stuff like that. So I was like, no, babe, I got you. Come on, get out. No what was her, what was her out. job? She was services. She was services. Okay. So she was a hotel and, you know, building and all that stuff. Yeah, and handing out stuff. basketballs and towels. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So she was, she was a cute girl. So she had no problems. You know, everybody loved her. Right. You know? right, so right. She was really having a hard time uh, on her job. And uh, I was like, no, worry about it. You know, no soon as she gets out, my, my knees, my knees start acting up and I'm struggling. And so she, my wife is, we've been married for 21 years, 21 years. Congrats. Three kids. Nice. Never, oh man, and fresh military, you know that don't they don't happen. Everybody got to watch one that does military. Everybody. And so, <laughs> Everybody. And so she uh she she never wavered, man. She always stuck by my side. She she never was like, Oh, you a dirt bag or you you gained all this weight or all this. She never none mm -hmm. of this stuff never came out of her mouth. She loved me and she wanted us to do, do better. And so she was fine with everything. So I took her when I got the when I got the civilian job. I took her off her job, and she was home for seven years with our kids homeschooling them, and so wow. she was there doing all of that. So fast forward to when I was um, uh, having problems with my eye. I woke up that morning, and I couldn't like when I closed my right eye. My left eye was like it was like a like a almost like a sheet coming down over it. Wow! I'm saying, what is that? Never had any problems with you know. Izzy would always lose his glasses when we when we met each other. Still, remember the, the same it, save it, save it, save it. <laughs> it we'll save, we'll save glasses. that. We'll save that story for our, our next session. Go ahead, but go ahead, keep going. I don't know what's going on my eye. I'm thinking it's something like in there, like because I have science issues, so I'm thinking it's something in there. Doctors don't know what's going on. I'm in the ER for twelve hours. 12 hours. Wow. Put me in the, put me in the room, put me in the hospital. I've never been, to, never spent a night in the hospital in my life. Put me in the hospital at night, man. It was just terrible. I was scared, man. I don't know if I got a tumor. I don't know. And when you, when you stare at death, death in the face like that, man, it changes you. Like it's something, when you stare down and you like sitting there, laying there in the quietness of the night and you don't know, you look at your kid and watching me a text message with my kids. They were all sleeping in my bed, all smiling. Hi, daddy. I just broke. Now, right. I don't know. I don't know if I got a tumor. I don't know if, if I got six months to live. I don't know anything. They can't tell me anything. They're completely perplexed. That's what's going on to me. And what really pissed me off was one doctor walked in the room. You know how arrogant doctors can be. He's like, mm -hmm. well, you can tell me. Did somebody hit you? I'm like, bro, I am wow. six foot two, three hundred ten pounds. People don't walk up to me and hit me. I promise you that. <laughs> so you really don't walk up to me and, and challenge me. That's just really not what happened. <laughs> and so I wake up the next morning and I, and I was the night, the whole night I just prayed. I didn't know what else to do. I just prayed. And I said, whatever happens, I'm going to fight. And that's all I got left in me is to fight. Next morning, the doctor comes in and he's like, well, the MRI did showed you have detached retina. We don't know why it's detaching, but it's detaching. Wow. You do a quick surgery and you should be good. I'm thinking, okay, cool. Let's do the surgery. I don't know what's going on, but they said they could fix it. They could fix it. Mm. Six. Surgeries later, six surgeries in six months. Six Jesus. surgeries in six months on a high. Right. And I never stopped working. 
I never stopped working. And I, the more surgeries I had, the more blind I became. So now I'm completely blind in my left eye. And so I'm just like, I, I'm like, what's going, wow. what's going on? But I, yeah. I refused to quit. So the next, the next month after I sat, that day, I started school working with a master's degree. And I literally was working on the master's degree. I was typing like this, wow. one hand on one eye, typing papers right. because I wasn't going to quit. Because I knew I, I knew what I wanted. And so that kind of brought, that kind of brings you up to where I started to, uh, well, my wife and I started marriage counseling at our church. That rolled into us life coaching, marriage coaching. And then I wrote the book in uh, <clears throat> 19. Was it 18 or 19? I can't remember. 18 and 19 was when I wrote the book. She wrote her book at the same time, published hers uh, for women. And uh, that kind of brings you to where we are now. Now we're knee deep into marriage coaching. I'm still working full time, but the, the hope is to transition by, uh, by the time I'm 47, transition out of Lackland to full time life coaching. That is, dude, honestly, like you and I have kept in touch here and there. Um, and I know it's because of just constant movement mm -hmm. on my part, constant movement on your part and everything else. But when I read your book, dude, and I even I even messaged you after it. But when I read your book, I was really, really like just amazed on how real it was. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of time when people write books, especially when you have friends that know you and things like that, you know, you're sort of skeptical about what you want to write in there because you don't want to divulge too much. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you don't want them yeah. to really read yeah. your true self because then they, you know, it's going to be like, damn, I didn't know that about you. Or they start asking questions and everything else. But for me, honestly, man, I was just like, I was blown away just because of the fact that it was so pure to the, the writing and everything mm. else that you could really understand what you were dealing with. You know what I'm saying? Like, even, even, even that it, and I really like that you made it into a, a biblical relation. You know what I'm saying? Like, even though you, you put your lingo into it, but you also backed it up with just spiritual content as well. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So it, let's talk about the book because again, it's incredible. I hope you write another one. You know what I'm saying? I hope you got one in the works or whatever the case would be, but don't stop writing because I, I really, really, really enjoyed it. So what inspired that like what it was it everything that you went through that really inspired it or was it just something within your time frame of you going into from the military to civilian like like what inspired you did your wifey come up to you and say hey honey maybe you should write a book about this like what inspired you to write this book and that's a great question man and before I answer the question I gotta do this one thing I gotta tell you I owe you an apology man and it's been bothering me for years I am so sorry, man. The day that your father died, and you you were up on the balcony on the second floor, and you just got off work, and I was going to work or something like that, and you said, "Hey," and I kind of looked up, and I think we had moved back to the dorm at that time. Right. <clears throat> you said, "Hey, my dad died," and I just kind of looked at you, and I kind of shook my head, and I was like, I, "I'm sorry," and kind of walked off. Man, I owe you an apology. I didn't have the language <clears throat> at 20 years old to even comprehend what that meant for you, you know, and I, and I'm so sorry, brother, from the bottom of my heart. I'm so sorry. I appreciate I that, man. Up there and hugged you and told you, um, and I was there for you. And I just didn't, I was so young and stupid that I couldn't even fathom you had lost your father. So, but, man, you I, know, I, to, I, I'm sorry, bro. It, it's all good because when, when that happened, when I came out and told you that I was already going, I was going to the airport, my emergency leave kicked in. I was already leaving. So it wasn't like me telling mm -hmm. you that and I was going back to Maroon, then you were going to see me the next day. But I was I was yeah. already going. And, you know, I'll, I'm going to share this story. It was it, it truly was incredible because my even my people in my unit, even though I'm friends with some of them, but nobody came to my room to see how Ooh. I was doing. Except for one man. One man got oh. off a night shift, came to my room, and he was like, I heard what happened because he was the controller on duty. He heard what happened, everything else. He was like, I want to make sure you're okay, and I'm going to take you to the airport. I was just overcome with emotions. You know, I, my, my phone just rang. My brother just told me this and everything else. You know, uh, Red Cross told me I'm, uh, the emergency leave is approved. I'm going, this and this and that. But I didn't know if I was going to make it in time. And this man, Marcus, this man stood there. He goes, before we leave, he said, I'm going to pray. 
And I'm going to pray that you make it to spend some time with your father and that he doesn't pass before you get there. And we prayed. He and I prayed. Now, I my upbringing was Pentecostal. But as I got older, my mom made it to where it was like, if you want to go to church, you go to church. But, you know, she would always, her and my dad used to always talk about the Bible and everything else, Jesus, God, and everything. And literally, I sat there with this senior master, or this mass sergeant at the time. I sat with him, and he prayed. And Marcus, believe it or not, when I came back to Brooklyn the first night, I went straight to the hospital, and my dad was still alive. Isn't that crazy? And he was, he, he had, my father passed away from liver sclerosis. He was already on his last days, on his last legs. And again, 19 years old, I don't know. I was like you, I don't know what's going on. Nobody's, you know, is he going to make it? Is he not going to make it? The, the communication between me and my family was very limited because, it, they, you know, they're trying to get themselves to where he's at because they're military too. So it was like a big scramble from all of us. And my first emergency leap, I just got out of tech school. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm there. I'm learning. I'm in training. I, I don't know what's going on. And this is my first emergency leap. And nobody from my shop came. I, it happened like 6 in the morning, 6.30 in the morning, except for this one. He got off work, came to my room. I, I will never forget. On to this day, I still talk to him. But he came to my room and did all that. And this man, made he, he was a born again. He was on his path. He was an alcoholic. He was, you know, in the military. Like, it was going bad for him until he found God again. And, th and you know, he was still sort of new into the, the born again and everything else. But he came and prayed for me and... But but I appreciate it, Marcus, man. Like I said, it, it, it was I, I understand where you come from. But at the same time, I was already going. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I was like, let me get on this emergency leave, man. You know what I'm saying? But I, I mean, there was nothing else I could do. I was just like, hey, I got to go, you know. So but I appreciate you know, that, that. Go ahead. That was a, that, that moment right there was a catalyst for me writing the book. There were several other moments like that in my life. Uh, or I saw in friends or, or men around me where men, we just aren't taught to handle emotions properly. We aren't taught to how to deal with things. We aren't taught to, to because for us, emotions, things, right? Mm -hmm. And what the, the, the common narrative is that to show emotion, you got to show it like a woman. You know, you got to show, you got to cry and all this other stuff. And that's not always the case. And I, and I think men, we do things differently. And so the, the catalyst behind the book was to show Hey guys, these are some things that we're doing that's not working for us. These right. are some ways that we could be better. Uh, these are some ways that we did. We we accept the fact that as men we have to protect, protect, provide, procreate, all of the four P's, mm -hmm. problem solve, yada yada yada. We, we accept those things. But however, we are not doing a very good job of us being there for our kids emotionally. And that's and we do it differently than women. Being there for our wives. Uh, being being faithful to our wives, you know, those type of things right. that, that that generally people assign to men, and it, it's the whole term toxic masculinity, which I hate. the the whole The whole title of the book was kind of like a a, a a slap in the face to this whole narrative that men are just toxic. Everything we do is toxic. If we hunt, right. we're toxic. If we like have sex, we're toxic. All this stuff, you know, it's kind of slapping the face of that. Is that we are human beings too. We have the issues. We go through a whole lot of crap. And that we have to keep moving. We don't get to sit on the curb and cry and everybody comes and pats on my shoulder and tells you, no, they expect mm -hmm. you as a man to produce at all costs. And so that was a, the counsel in the book to say, brother, I see you, I understand you, and this is some things that we can work on and we'll work them together. So I put myself in the book. I, I went through all those different types of men and I want everybody to know that I'll tell them my story too. So I air my dirty laundry. I told everybody about my addiction to pornography that was ruining my marriage. I talked about all that stuff. My kids read this book. They know the stuff their dad went through. They know about me being broke and all the stuff that came came along with it and, and, and all the strife that came along with that, the pressure that came along with that. So the catalyst behind it was I just want men to be better because I know <clears throat> that I want to be better. I want to be a better man. So that was the catalyst behind it. That's awesome, man. Like I said, it, it, it just feels so true, word for word, just reading each chapter and everything else. Now, you said toxic masculinity. You know what I'm saying? Because give us, give us like the definition for our, our listeners and viewers, like why you chose that? Why toxic masculinity? Why? 
So toxic masculinity is a, is a kind of a, a buzzword. It's kind of one of those internet words that people use to shame men by saying that, you know, everything that a man does is toxic, you know, but really the, the, the textbook definition of toxic masculinity is those archetypes I talked about in the book. The, the mm -hmm. dictator, the man who comes home and just yells and screams and, and drinks and, and beats his kids and beats his wife. That form of mask. Anytime you use your masculinity to overpower someone when you're not defending yourself or you use right. it to intimidate or you use your, your power as a man to abuse your authority that God's given you, that is a, the real definition of toxic masculinity. You know, the father who can't sit down and talk with his kids, the man who can't tell his wife, hey, I love you, I hear you, uh, yeah. can't lead properly. He has to lead with force and, and with his size, and that's toxic masculinity. Not going hunting, you know, like, <laughs> see, like oh, that's toxic masculinity. You like, you like sports, toxic masculinity. Yeah. That's not <laughs> Now you mentioned you mentioned the archetypes in there of different variations of toxic masculinity. Now the three that really stood out to me, I didn't realize how many there, there are. You know what I'm saying? And and it's crazy how some men don't really see it within themselves. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like they just think what what they're doing is natural that that's what a man's supposed to do. Now the three that really stood out for me, and I want you to give a breakdown of each one I'm going to give you: the womanizer, the bad boy. And the damn mama's boy. <laughs> Cause those three, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you, those three have really stood. I, I've seen it. You know what I'm saying? Again, I'm a single guy. I'm not married. I've never really been in a relationship. You know what I'm saying? It never happened. But the, my surroundings, the people who are, I have actually witnessed majority of the time them being one of those archetypes. You know what I'm saying? And they don't even realize it. They don't even know that they that, that that person in front of their lady you know what i'm saying so i'm gonna save the mama's boy for last but give me a breakdown of the womanizer <laughs> what is what is the womanizer of the of the men characteristic i think i started the chapter by saying we all know this guy we all have met the womanizer he's the guy who just cannot get enough vagina he can't get enough he just he has to have a woman at all times he got <laughs> let me raise my hand <laughs> well, we all can't get enough but you know what i mean like he yeah, just yeah, has yeah, to yeah, have yeah. He like he shops at costco like he you know he don't shop in <laughs> he shops in quantity, right you know? yeah <laughs> He, he's the pretty oh, he's boy, the right? The pretty boy, the oh, the, yeah. the the Rico Suave, the Papi Chulo. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, he, he he loves to he loves the company of women, which is nothing wrong with that. But he mm -hmm. sees women as objects. That's the problem. His problem with this guy is he sees women as sexual objects, and he treats them as such. But because of his suave ways, he's able to get away with it. And uh, I think a single man, let's say you're single, let's say you are a womanizer, I look at that different. The worst kind of womanizer is the married womanizer. That's the guy, the guy who he's married, he can't keep his hand cookie jar. He's always got a woman on the side. Mm -hmm. He's always got something going on. And what these guys do is they leave a trail of broken hearts behind them. So yeah, when I met my wife, my wife was engaged. She had been engaged a year, a couple years before she met me to a womanizer. So I had to come in and pay for all that crap. I had to undo mm. all of this bull crap. So that's what it, the nice guy spends last. That's where that comes from. Right. Because the womanizers are out here breaking hearts and causing breaking up homes and causing all this strife. And so it really creates a negative uh, image for men, which is why, which, which is what makes him toxic. Uh, he's, yep. pretty, he's pretty easy. We all know that guy. Yeah, because if it, I've, 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 I've even, hold on, I've even noticed that with the womanizer, they leave that woman with so such low self-esteem that they can't see themselves with anybody else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they feel like if this person leaves me, then there is nobody else out there for me because he was supposed to be it. You know what I'm saying? But their mentality is so shot. And I've seen, I'm, I'm witness to this. I've seen some mm -hmm. females that are just like, I'm, I'm no good because he's leaving me. And it's just like, yeah, are you yeah. kidding me? Like you're pretty. You got a good head on your shoulders. You work. You know. You know how to cook, mm -hmm. clean. Not many women could do that. You know how to cook, clean. <laughs> and you, you're gonna think mm -hmm. you're gonna belittle yourself so bad like that that you're gonna just allow yourself for one guy to control you. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's crazy. So the next one is the bad boys. Break me down the bad boys. Yeah. Yeah. And but the truth about the womanizer, that's his goal. His goal mm -hmm. is to because he has low self-esteem. He just hides it in the false bravado. 
We've all done it. Gotcha. That false bravado, you know, we call it machismo, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. it's, it's all it's all a ruse because he has low right. self-esteem. So he brings her self-esteem down so he can feel like she's up here. So, yeah, the bad boy. The bad boy, that's the one that gets on my nerves the most. This is the guy. You know, he, <laughs> he's the guy that he sees God's gift to everyone around. You know, he's, you know, in the movie, you see him leather jacket, smoking a cigarette. You know, he's mm -hmm. just... He's just, he speaks with one word answers. You know, he's just, he just, you can't just, he, he's just so much better than everybody around him. And so the bad boy is the guy that doesn't like rules. He doesn't like to perform. You know, we've all probably all had a troop like that. Probably all, I know mm -hmm. I got, yeah. They I don't have. like things. They follow them with authority. Yeah, they do not like authority. Don't tell me what to do. Don't make me do this. I'll do it when I get to it. And that guy, he creates havoc everywhere he goes. He's the, I had, I even had an employee like that. Horrible, horrible mm -hmm. to to deal with the bad boy, and the bad boy is simply a man who never who grew up in chaos, and he brings chaos wherever he goes. He doesn't know how gotcha. to conform. He doesn't know how to just sit there and be himself. So he tries to change the world around him, or he just goes into exile. He's a loner. He doesn't like. He's not a team player. He's he's just one of those guys that nobody really wants to be around. Ladies right. like him because he's dark and mysterious usually. Um, but the problem with the bad boy is that he could never really connect on an emotional level with anyone, which makes him toxic. Give me, give me one second. Hold on. Yeah. So what's interesting about that, Marcus, is like when you're, when you're talking about the womanizer, one military seems like it breads like a whole bunch of us. It's like all three of those are like military guys. Like it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> um, what's funny though is, is, is like, you know, like you're saying, like when, once a person is womanizer, like a lot of that stuff is like they they really are alone the most like they're some of the loneliest people because like they never share nothing with anyone else um and i've been that guy for sure like you know i was that guy when i was in the military someone was like hey you don't ever bring you know sand to the beach i took that literally and i was like all right cool man we're gonna go with we're gonna do as much as you can and just like you're saying man i've i've really hurt a lot of women i like there's like there's a part of me that when i moved back home i was like man there might be a couple women i run into and i have to really say i'm sorry like you got you got you got me at a really bad time and i could care less about the kind of feelings i left like i just left a lot of you know especially and, and i was deployed in iraq so i was like you know what i told izzy like you know I, I got i got um dumped in iraq and so that's bad right and it's kind of funny at the same time but also what what i didn't talk about was for the next two years <laughs> that was my my line that was a puppy dog line man i used it i i kill game that way like it was a i left destruction for two years and it's funny and it's not funny because what i did it's funny that like that's actually was a thing of sitting there saying, yeah, I got, you know, I was supposed to get married and, and she dumped me in Iraq and that was my line. And so then I would tell a girl, you know what? That's why I don't want to get in a relationship. I don't want to do that. And they would all be okay with it. And I would do the dumbest shit in the world and they would put up with my shit and they would let me. Um, and then after a while I got tired of sitting there saying, I'm, I'm tired of those things. Right. And then, you know, and I, I think that's interesting to see is, is like, I wasn't doing it cause I was a, I thought I was a thing in the world. I thought it cause I was really hurt. And instead of processing the emotion of like, hey, man, I got broke, I got dumped, that hurt my feelings, that hurt all this stuff. I was like, you know what, I'm going to go out and try whatever I can and, you know, you know, put numbers on the belt or whatever. I'm just going to run up numbers. And I did. And like, and I hurt a lot of women a lot of times. And the sad part is I never, I, you know, what I mean, like I had no attachment to anyone. So I spent almost two years of really never growing and just never dealing with the problem. And it manifested two years later and it's like why is this happening you know that's what happens when you start pushing those things down you don't ever deal with them yep well i always tell people too uh, also you know there's a, there's another component to this and uh i don't talk about it in the book much because the book was written for men but you know uh, women don't choose are not good at choosing men they're just not they're just not uh i tell my daughter this all the time like any guy you're serious about bring him to me or your brothers because <laughs> Women choose men based off of looks and emotion. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. You know, a lot of times the guy that's good for you is not the guy that you, that's going to make you tingle downstairs. Correct. You know what I mean? So a lot, a lot of times, a lot of women will pass up a good guy to go for that guy, like like you said, Mike, like you used to be, you know, suave and, you know, all the stuff that you know, beard connects and all that stuff like that, you know? So <laughs> a lot of times they'll, they'll fall for that and then they get hurt. And then a guy like, a guy like, you know, Izzy had to come along and be like, hey, look, you know, got to build her back up. And then as soon as she gets back on her feet, she's like, oh, I'm going to run back to Brad. You know, like, really? Mm -hmm. So that's another side of that whole thing, too. And I think that may be the next book 
I think that's something I may kind of bring up in the next book is the other side of the house because there is uh you know we can't we we tend to to idealize women in our in our society where they you know this sugar and spice and everything nice and we all are old enough. no that's not true right and so I think that may be the next book we may we may die and I'm really pissing women off but it'll be okay I'm married so whatever. <laughs> Don't don't piss them off. You gotta look out for the single people, man. <laughs> because they'll read the book and they'll be like, "Oh hell no, Israel, get out of here. This ain't gonna be no, you up in here." You know what's actually funny though is like seriously though, when you're a guy who's married and you don't care and you're not trying to sleep with other women, you're not trying. Like there's there's a different level that comes with it. You're right. you're more honest. You're more upfront and you're like genuine. And people are like, "Oh wow," I'm like, and it's like it's because I don't want nothing. For, like I don't want nothing from you, but your companionship. That's it. I don't want anything that. And I'm telling you, man, a, a, a guy is dangerous when he's like, I'm not trying to get anything from you. I'm just being me. And I, I think that's the best route. I was like, hey, I'm married, man. They're like, oh, we, we, once a guy says, hey, I'm married, I'm good. Yeah, you yeah. Yeah, better watch out. I think yeah. I, maybe you, maybe you experience this, Mike, maybe you haven't. But I would say that I had, I've had more women shoot their shot at me since I've been married than I ever did when I was single. I had wow. to work for it when I was single. Now it's like, you see this big old ring on my finger, man, women don't care. They're like, they oh, don't. you because know, you're with them. You, you, they know that you're safe. They see you as safe for some reason. It's crazy. Yeah. I, was, I told my wife, I was like, you better be glad you got me young. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I was single, it would have been a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. My my laptop here was uh, about to take the, a dump right now. But um, so tell tell us about the mama boy. Break us down the, the last one, the mama boy. All right. The mama boy is in my, in my opinion i think it's put this in the book i think he's probably the most dangerous because he's insidious he's very insidious he he's a he's an average guy there's really nothing flashy about him but the problem is that he gains all of his all of his uh validation is from women it hasn't come from a woman he he was raised by women he's more comfortable around women you met guys like that all oh, they, they just love oh. being around women uh, most of the time, that dad was in and out of his life, but not there at all. Uh, he's not really comfortable in his masculinity. He's very uh, feminine in his approach to life, extremely emotional, hard time controlling his emotions. Um, he just tends to, tends to, he's not gay, he's not anything like that, but he tends to be more comfortable around women. And what that does is it creates a dynamic to where he never can fully be the man that he should be because he's mm -hmm. so busy, so entrenched in that feminine energy. He's not used to masculine energy. And so just like us doing this call right now, we're, we're all grown men. We all got life experience and we all respect each other. Um, the mama's boy doesn't tend to do that very well. Right. Uh, is it, I think back in the day we used to wrestle. Now, you know, back in the day, I was probably like 240 when you met me. Like, there's no way mm -hmm. you could out wrestle me. We used to play around <laughs> like, you and I both knew that. We were, you respected the fact that I was bigger and stronger than you, and I respected the fact that you were faster than me. But mama's boys don't tend to respect boundaries. Right, they don't respect right. boundaries, and they don't understand that. So you get the guy who, perfect example, the player hating guy, the guy who's trying to, the Dirty Mac, you ever heard of Dirty mm -hmm. Mac before? That's mm -hmm. usually a mama's boy. He's the one going back to the girl, yeah, you know, is he cheating on you? Like, yeah. you no know, bro code with this dude, man. And so he's, he, the, he's, he's, he's the cock blocker. Dangerous. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's dangerous. <laughs> he can't have a guy around. Yeah. He, he doesn't understand his masculinity. And so he gets in relationships with women and he wrecks them because he ends up acting more like a woman than she does. So mm -hmm. he's just as dangerous, but probably more dangerous because he's not as overt with it as, let's say, the womanizer is. A womanizer, oh. you're going to know what he is. So for a yeah. boy, he'll get in there and sneak in the back door. So he's that guy. Yeah. Now, here's, here's the crazy part. And I've seen this with some of them, like the womanizer, the bad boy. Why do you think it is that the woman go back? You know it's happening right in front of your face. You know he's he's cheating on you, even though he's not telling you, but you see it. You know what I'm saying? Or your girlfriends are telling you like, yo, John Doe over here, he's, he, I saw him with this girl, that girl, whatever. But yet you're still like, no. The bad boy, you know, he's 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 treating you, disrespecting you, and everything. God forbid, domestic violence or whatever. But you go back. Why? Why do you think it is that these women go back to that, knowing that is not good for them, not good for them? Well, women. The truth of the matter is, and and I've been I've been counseling married couples and mentoring men for uh, about eight years now. Awesome. Women have bigger egos than men. Mm. 
they don't want to admit it. A woman has a bigger. It's, it's hard for a woman to accept the fact that a man has has cheated on her and left her. Because <laughs> I got to, you know, I, it's me. How could you cheat on me? And so right. a lot of times they'll go back just so they think they think they can win him over. And no yeah. man in the history of mandom has ever wiped a woman just <laughs> because. <laughs> just, just, just like they they think that they get that. My my dad calls that little patch of hair. That little patch of hair between their legs, they think that they can they can they can make you do whatever. And it, the thing about the womanizer and men like that, they're not gonna be controlled by no poo nanny. It ain't happening. Mm-hmm. They're gonna be in control because they have to be. They have to. Right. Be. They're not gonna be controlled by that. And most most dudes be like they'll do anything. You they call them like beta males. You ever heard that term beta males? Like a beta male would do anything for some booty. Womanizer yeah. men like that, they 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 come across as confident which women are, it's like catnip to a woman. And so they always go back to that guy because they, they, they secretly want his approval. Right. That's the truth. They want his approval. They want to be the number one because women are attracted to masculine energy. Good or bad, they're attracted to masculine energy. And so <clears throat> a lot of times what a woman will do is she, will, she, she wants that guy's approval, so she'll go back to him thinking that she can somehow submit him with her mm-hmm. little patch of hair or whatever right. for a while she's usually having, but beta males they give that to women free. And if so, you get something too easy, it's not it's not as good, you know. So I think that's really what it is. You know, and it's and it's crazy because I had a a real good friend of mine. She was married to her man uh, for like seven eight years, and while they were in the service. And honestly, bro, like within those eight years majority of it was him physically abusing her and finally you know she just couldn't deal with it anymore she ended up divorcing and everything else and she went her own way and everything but as i'm talking to her i you know i asked her the same thing but how eight nine years like how did you stick with it that long with all this happening and you know what it, you know what she told me man it was the hope factor hoping mm. that the next day he would have changed but guess what? Yep. The next day, John Doe over here was not changed. He was slapping you up. Mm-hmm. That so he'll slap her up Monday. Come to Monday night, she's like, "Oh, it's okay. He'll change tomorrow." Tuesday night, Getty slapped yeah. up. She's like, "It's okay. He'll change tomorrow." The whole fact that I, yeah. you know, and I've, you know, I've seen comedians talk about little jokes about it here and there, but I was like, "Is how is that really reality?" You know what I'm saying? And she was like, yeah, it's true. Lot, because man. a lot of women hope that their men will change to this shiny knight mm-hmm. that he's, you know, the guy that they first met when they when they when they first started dating or, or anything else, or the, the, the man that she met that she thought she was marrying at the beginning, and she was hoping yeah. he was gonna change. And unfortunately it took, you know, the the straw that broke the camel's back for her to be like, I can't she was it was like I can Tina. She was like, I can't do this no yeah. more, man. Like, oh, yeah. you know, you and, and she, you know, you're still in the military. You're going to work. You put in uniform. She's walking into work with shades. And of course, she gave oh. the cliche. I fell or yeah. this happened or that happened. You know what I'm saying? But never one was able to stand up to be like, he is doing this to me. He is mm-hmm. abusing me. He's, you know, something needs to happen. But again, the hope factor, man. Do you see that a lot? Like, do you see the hope factor in a lot of these women? Absolutely, man. I, I think it has a lot to do with energy. Um, so when you, when you pursue a woman, within the first, I would say, two to three minutes, tell me if I'm wrong, easy, since you, you, you're out there. Within the two, first two or three minutes, you can tell, you know, what she is, right? Is mm-hmm. she, you know, like the term we used to use, is she a, is she a couch or is she a bed? You know, right. am I going to take her to the couch or am I going to take her to my bedroom? You know, right. that's what it is. So you kind of know, and these guys with these personalities, the womanizer, the uh, the dictator, they can pick out a woman that has low self-esteem. They can pick it up. It doesn't matter how pretty she is. It doesn't matter how achieved she is, how many degrees she has, or what, how, you know, whatever rank she's achieved. Low self-esteem is low self-esteem. Right. And so they, they tend to target women that have those those personality types, and they zero in on them, and then they put all of their focus and energy on them, and it, and it makes their girl feel special. And so then she mm-hmm. thinks she's getting this great guy, but the truth of the matter is she's getting a man that's going to abuse her. And so when the abuse starts, women are great storytellers. Women mm-hmm. are great storytellers. They will tell you, Mike, you ever had it? Well, I'm going to get you in trouble. I'll put it on me. 
<laughs> you know, I had a, had a, a discussion, a heated discussion with my wife before. This happened a few times in 21 years. And she had this whole song made up in her head. And I'm like, that's not even how it went down. Yeah. I wasn't even that. She telling me what I was thinking. <laughs> so yeah. a lot of people tell themselves a the story. They'll tell right. a story about this guy. We'll use Mike as an example. But Mike's a great guy. You know, he just gets a little angry sometimes. And you know, sometimes I I hurt, I get him mad, so he hits me because I got him mad. So they tell you some these delusional stories over and over again. You tell yourself a story long enough, you believe it. Right. So I, I think that's really where where it comes from, man. Uh, it's sad, but uh, a lot of these women, if you if we're gonna if we're gonna put women on pedestals. They, they're gonna have to stay there. If we're not, then we're gonna be equal, which we keep talking about, all we hear about equality, you right? Be accountable for your actions, which means the choices that you make, which means the men that you choose. And so it sounds really mean, but I tell women all the time in culture and people, you teach people how to treat you. Right. Let me go out one night and stay out and don't call my wife, tell her I ain't, I ain't come <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> I hope you got. I hope you got a hotel to stay at. There's <laughs> gonna be some furniture moving around here because if she did the same thing, it's gonna be oh, the same yeah. result. Yeah. You know, yeah. To me. And so you teach people how to treat you, and a lot of these women teach these men it's okay to treat them that way. And if you teach them that, then people are gonna treat you that way. That's kind of the way it works, man. And you know what's crazy? Like I, I see that disconnect as, as you say. For me, I've always seen it fifty-fifty, right? Like you said, if you're going to go out, expect consequence and everything else. Or if your wife lets you go out, then you're going to go out and hang out and everything else. But it has to be vice versa. If you want, mm-hmm. if you don't want your lady to go out, then you need to let your lady know that you don't want her to go out. Just like if she doesn't want you to go out, she's going to tell her not to go out. But that's why I see the disconnect a lot. I've seen a lot of my boys be like, yo, Izzy, I'm visiting. Remind you, I'm a guest. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm here to hang out. I'm the single guy. But that's another thing. A lot of girlfriends or wives, when they see the single guy, ooh, like they see me with horns and a tail and everything else. They think I'm Diablo coming into the house, right? But that's one of the biggest disconnect I see is that the dudes will be like, I'm going out. And I will be like, but how about the missus? And you'd be like, no, no, it's just for the guys. Let's just go out. But when the missus Mm -hmm. is like, yo, I'm doing a ladies night. Oh, hell no. Why are you going out? Why you need to do this? Why you need to do that? And she's like, bro, but I let you go out. You know what I'm saying? Like, Mm -hmm. what's going on? It has to be a 50-50. I'm a a big believer that trust for me, trust is, is the foundation of relationship because trust opens up so many other doors right i feel like if you have trust with your partner then you can communicate openly you can let your man go out without a problem you can let your lady go out without a problem and you know there is no there is no uh hiding anything like if your lady says yo what'd you do today i'm gonna tell you what i did because i trust you enough to know that i'm not cheating Mm -hmm. on you i won't do anything to ruin the relationship or anything like that but guys there's, is that big disconnect? I don't think they understand it. But man, the single guy, <laughs> I always get the rap, bro. Like, for, I'll be honest with you. Like, when, if I met you and your wife, like, let's say, you know, we're just hanging out or whatever. I need to butter up to the wife. Like, I need to make her like me as the single guy. Because I feel like with guys, we could click easily. You know, talk about sports, talk this. We're clicking. You know what I'm saying? But I feel like I need to, like, if I go to Mike's house, I got to make sure his wife likes me. Because if I say, nah. Mike, let's go to the bar, I, it's not going to happen. She's going to be out, oh, hell no, this single guy, this and that. But but Mike's good in his relationship and his marriage. Well, this is why I disagree. Like, I, 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 I understand that. And this is why I say not for me. And a lot of times, and I've done this because I've been divorced, military divorce. And I'll tell you why. And this is why I think so. Maybe, maybe Marcus, you can tell me this or no. You're my, like, back in the day, you would have been my scapegoat. Anything goes wrong, you the guy. Why? Because you ain't going <laughs> to live on it. Like, you ain't got to do, you ain't got to stay here. So you would always be the scapegoat before you even get there. Like, I, no shit, bullshit. I would do this with my friends. The, I would have one and he would be the fuck up. And I would always, before he even anything, we go out or anything, I would always tell stories about him. Why? So it plant that seed. I'm, I'm a manipulative motherfucker. Like, and mama's boy, I'll tell you, I will get to that. Hey, I want to talk to you about that, though. But seriously, I would do that, though. So that way she would know. She'd be like, I don't like that guy. Why? Because I would put in her head that that person's up to no good. I'm the good guy. Right. That's why I say now, now, like, no, man, because wife already knows, like, if you're like, hey, let's go out. Cool, we going out, but, like, 12 o'clock, man, I'm getting tired, man. I'm probably going to come home. I'm not going to drink, you know, and she knows he's about me. And so that's, you know, that's, I think that's a difference. Um, and again, is a, a, like, 
we talk and stuff like that. She knows who my friends are. She understands my circle small for those reasons. But back in the day, I probably would have definitely crucified you, throw you up on there as a, just just in case if the, the night got too crazy. It was that, but that's true though, man. A lot of guys will do that. They will. They have that one friend. <laughs> but to go to the mama's boy though. To go to the mama's boy, which is, is again, I can really agree with this one, and and this is where I really want to talk to you, um, and and I really, you know, I've said this before, I've had a hard time coming into the military because no dad in my life, like met him three times, like no idea about being a man and those things, um, had no idea. So when I'm around, I'm in the military and I'm around guys, and we're like making fun of each other, this and that, I would take it personal. I thought it was really like, I'd be like, man, you know, one on one, we're we're good, and around my friends, you're over here like making fun of me. We're not friends. And I would get really feminine about it. I didn't know how to handle those things. And and when it would go to girls, very manipulative. Like, I mean, I'm very manipulative, like talking about like planting seeds, like what he was saying, like, hey, man, you know, and what I used to do back in, in like junior high and high school, um, all I would do is like if a girl got a guy and he did her wrong, I would do the opposite because that was 100 percent the easiest thing in the world to do. Mm-hmm. And they, they would fall for it every fucking time. I was the exact same thing as that person, but I would just put on a disguise. That was a like, complete opposite. And they would tell me, really, I want you to be this kind of person. And then you would do it. And they would just be like, oh, cool. And then, you know, it would it'd just be the same thing over again. Yep. But my, my real thing is that is that, you know, we're, we're finding a lot of men right now. They're not real men. And it's a lot of it's because they have no role models. You know, I've been around younger men and the way they talk to each other. We would never talk like, you know, they call each other bitch. They like, make fun yeah, of each yeah, other. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's like there's a difference between making fun of each other, having a good joke, and then there's a difference between disrespectful. And I've yeah. seen a lot of the younger generation really doesn't understand the difference between that. And and I you know I have a friend that he's a little bit younger, and he had no dad in his life, and and you know some of the things he he kind of expresses are very feminine. And it's like, hey, you don't have that male role model. So for you, what do you think are some things that help some of these? Guys? Or actually, I'll tell you a real quick story about Mama's boy, and then if you could tell us this, um, there was a guy who was Air Force guy. He was married, of course, and uh, I think his, when his wife, when him and his wife were dating, she would spend over the night. The, the, the woman told me, because I used to work with her, she said the mom would, would, they would be like, you know, after coitus and stuff like that, the morning after, the mom would sneak in and get snuggled in between the both of them in bed. That's how much of a mama boy this kid was, where she was like hugging. What? <laughs> yeah. That's weird. <laughs> So That's yeah, crazy. but anyways, so do you have any things for like any kind of young men that are going through things like, hey, how can they find to be a role model? And what are some good ways to kind of like learn how to be a man? That's a great question, Mike. I, I have built a whole uh, business off of that. I, I literally coach men through masculinity. So uh, I, I, I talk about masculine frame a lot. It's, it's, a, it's a term that was that... Uh, was coined, came out of like the red pill community on YouTube. I don't know if you heard it, the red pill guys, but they're some of my little crazy stuff. But masculine frame is basically the way a man um, conducts himself in the world. Um, whereas men, we are not, and we should not be overly emotional. We should be logical. You know, that's that's my thing is that you have to learn how to, to, to set your emotions to the side. It's okay for you to be emotional, to have your emotions, to be in contact with them, but they cannot run you. That's your woman's job. You have to run your logic. Your woman runs her logic through her emotions. We, we talk to your wife. Does she say, I think or I feel? Oh, I feel always, definitely. Exactly. Because a woman's first thought is emotion. A man should always say, I think. You'll never hear me say, I feel like, Mike, I feel. No, I think. Because my logic is the first thing. So to a young man who, does, who didn't have a father, <clears throat> first thing I will say is that it doesn't make you less of a man. Because a lot of men feel like they can never catch up to everybody else. The truth is, you just got to work a little harder. You got to read. You got to become a student. You got to. You got to read. I, I heard you talking about Audible, and you know you have dyslexia. I man, I applaud you for that. That is amazing. Because a lot of people will use that as an excuse not to read. I'm a big reader. I love mm-hmm. David Goggins, Joe Rogan. Uh, I, I read Jordan Peterson. I literally read thousands of books before. So my first thing would be for that young man to. Surround himself with men of character, men of standard. Don't go to the barber shop and hang out with those with the dudes that's talking about cheating on their wives and all that stuff like mm-hmm. that. You want to be a real man that stands up and does the right thing. You got to get around real men. You got to watch. I mean, you got to study. Um, I think the way of the superior man. That's a book by Dave Gita. Great book. Recommended to any young man, any 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 man. Period. But definitely any young man coming into his uh his maleness. 
Way of the Superior Man is a great book. It's a little weird at points, but it is a great it's a great read. I would also say that for that young man, he's going to have to accept the fact that that yes, your father wasn't there, but that's that doesn't have to be you. And you also, I, you know, I'm 43 years old now, man, and I really a lot of things that I learned as a young man learned that I'm un, I'm unlearning them to my sons. I really don't think a man should get married before he's 30 years old. I really don't. I got married at 22. People look at me like, see you, but I was so lucky, so blessed. So er, there were seven other couples that are friends of ours that got married around us that time. None of them made it. None of them wow. made it. Wow. I really think you don't really start to know who you are until you're in your 30s. And, and financially, it just makes sense. Unless you mm-hmm. can find a woman, which is going to be hard today, that's willing to build with you like my wife was willing to build with you, with me, eat off a cardboard box for three months like we did before I could afford to buy a table and not even complain yeah. not once, that wow. kind of woman, ain't she ain't around no more, Mike. You know yeah. that. You, you yeah. married, man. You know, she's not out there anymore. These women want everything right now. And so I would say, spend your 20s doing you, building your wealth up, getting your career together, getting your money together. And then when you're 30 and you're really ready to, to settle down, find you a woman that's going, that's going to get on your program. Find you a woman that's, that wants to be with you, not with not with your wallet. Find you a woman that wants to listen. Just a woman. She ain't got to be a 10. Find you a woman that wants to listen. If she's if she's pretty, that's a plus. But find you a woman that wants to listen and wants to get on your program. She don't care about you. She don't care about much, she don't care about much money you got. She just wants to be with you. And that woman is a rare thing. And if, I don't care if she's a 5. Marry her because it's a rare thing. I was blessed to get my wife at a very young age. I would not, if I were to go back at 22 years old, and if I didn't meet her, I, I'd probably be like you, Izzy. I oh, man, I look, I can't do it, bro. I can't put up with, no, you're not going to disrespect me. You're not going to talk right, crazy. Right. This is not going to happen. And so I, that's, that's what I would say a lot more to a young man, but to condense it down, I would say that he, he's going to have to do a lot of work. If he wants to be, the, be a man that's a man of character and a man of note, he's going to have to do a lot of work. He's going to have to read a lot. You got to get around, get a mentor. You got to get a coach. Call me. You gonna have to. Get, you gonna have to get around people that really, really are get the masculinity thing because you are gonna view everything from a feminine standpoint, and this doesn't work around men. I even said that in the book. If you want to find out who the mama's mm-hmm. boy is, just make, just get get in a group of guys and start making fun of the guys and see which guy gets emotional. That's your mama's boy. I That's your mama's boy. Yep. Yep. It's true. You know, what, what's interesting about all those things is, is like, you know, what you're saying is exactly what I had to do. I had to read books and I kind of almost feel like later on I had a little bit more advantage because you see some fathers today and they bring in some different baggage with them. So I was a little bit able to like at an advantage, be able to kind of select who I wanted to listen to. OK, Jordan Peterson, you know, 12 rules for life is on my wall. Why? Because those are some things I thought, was OK, it's a framework, you know, like what you're saying earlier. And I kind of felt like I had a little bit, you know. Let, I have a bigger advantage because I get a, I get to pick from all these people instead of because there's some people who who have a father and you know like like Izzy you're saying earlier that man that beat that woman there's a kid involved and there is yeah. there's a son he grows up thinking that and then we we seen some of those too mm-hmm. where it's like you know why'd you hit that woman it's like my dad hit my mom they've been together for twenty some odd years and da 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 and like they literally go this blind and so but it's it's a very near dear subject to my heart because I think you know a lot of people don't understand like. Being a man, being a man is it's, it, you know, it's birth and stuff like that. But it also like just because you have something between your legs don't make you a man at all. Like you have to yeah. work at it. And he, even when you're 30, even when you're 40, you got to continuously keep growing because it, it's like, you know, you have this ideas and thoughts, but, you know, are you going to stick to them forever? And so, you know, going to the, to the mama's boy again, you know, you're having men that are having this issue. What do you see for like younger men that are like the teens? So what are, so what are some things you think they can do to kind of get ready for the next level I think it really, they should really have a conversation with their mom <clears throat> you would be surprised how many men come in, in this room I mean this is this is my study this is where I do all my coaching and counseling via zoom or even face to face and I the first question I asked them one of the first questions I asked them is why are your parents not together and then they'll give the whole story and I say well did you ask your father that if he's still alive he's still around well, no, my mom told me. 99% of these young men don't even know the real story. Right. Like, 
you're married. I'm gonna go back to it again. There's his story, her story, and then that's the truth. Yep. I did that with my wife. We struggled in the beginning because my wife's father left when she was 12 years old. And I said, have you ever asked your dad what really happened? Well, no, my mom told me. You need to talk to your father. Talk to her dad, find out there's a whole, whole other side to this story mm-hmm. that she didn't, because we're gonna, we're gonna make ourselves the hero, right? In our own story, yep. it's just human nature. And so that's one of the first thing I would encourage a young man to do. First thing, talk to your father. If he's available, talk to your father or talk to somebody that was around during that time because the story you're getting may not be the story that actually happened. Two, number two, I would say there's so many programs out there to help these young men to, I have a friend, he's a veteran also, a retired man, Sergeant Darius Dante uh, Kirsch. He has a program called Males to Men United where he literally coaches young men just like I do, but on a larger scale. He goes to schools, he goes to church events, he goes all and coaches young men on how to be a man. What these are, he has seven principles that Males, because of, there's male, there's males and there's men. It's like you're right. saying, just because you're a penis doesn't make you a man. So right. you could be a male and not be a man. And so there's so many things that are like that. And uh, third thing I would definitely say is find a mentor. Mm. There, there are good men out there. Now he he may not be driving around the Rolls Royce, but he may be a barber. He may work at the factory. He may be a garbage man. That doesn't make him not a good man. We 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 boil men down to wallets and penises. That's what we boil mm-hmm. men down to. How much money you make? How good are you in bed? That's the way we measure men now. What? What? What is that? There's yeah. So much more than men bring to the table than their wallet and their penis. My dad made thirty thousand dollars a year, and that's the best man I've ever met before in my life to mm-hmm. this day. All right. High school education. Never set foot on the college campus. Smartest man I know. Yeah. So we have to get our male image up. If you look on TV, books, uh. social media, we're just we're jokes. We're a yeah. butt of this joke, and we, we have to get our image back to where we are men. And if we can't do that, then our society is going to crumble. Because I'm going to tell you right now, society was not built to be run by women. It was not. It was not. Yeah. Women are great. They're amazing. I'm married to one. I'm my mother. I got three sisters. Women are amazing, but they're not meant to, on the whole, run a society. If every man was off the face of the earth today, the society will crumble. Who's gonna who's gonna build a, build a road? Who's gonna purify the water? Who's gonna I mean think about it? Who's gonna serve who's gonna go on the front lines and fight? Yeah. This is what we're built for. We're built yeah. to run this world and we're built to do it the right way, but we've lost our way, man. I'm gonna get out of my yeah. soapbox now. But. <laughs> keep it going keep it. no but yo you know and it's scary because these teens nowadays all they talk about is smashing all they're talking about how many, you know what I'm saying? They're putting, they're putting all these fingers up and they're starting early. You know what I'm saying? They're starting, dude, at 12, 13 years old, I was too busy out on the streets playing stickball, football, you know, basketball and things like that. Like the last thing for me was these girls, you know what I'm saying? As to, I start getting older, but now with this, the, the generations now, 12 years old is that seven seconds of making out that seven seconds in heaven doesn't exist. Now they go, they're no, doing oral sex. They're doing, they're doing more. Too. Yeah. They're doing more intimate stuff. That is like, where is these conversations happening in the home? You know what I'm saying? Where, where's these mentors? Where's these role models to put these kids on the right path to say, Hey, you don't treat them like this. You don't say that to them like yeah. this. You don't, you, they're not, they're not games for you guys to, to talk amongst your friend and your chat groups to do send pictures. Cause now they're taking pictures and videos. You know what I'm saying? And they're sharing it like, yo, look at what I did. Like, that doesn't make you anything. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. I've, I, I, I mean, me and Mike has talked about this many times, but it was more in a, in a, in a working environment uh, setting. But the mentor is lacking. It's disappearing. It's becoming non and stays a rare species nowadays. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? These kids, most of these kids now, especially that are from third world countries or whatnot, their parents are so focused on trying to make it that they don't even give yep. these kids the time to be like, don't talk to her like that. Don't treat her like that. You know what I'm saying? They're not just stories. They're not a, they're not a, a tally mark on your, on your fucking, your belt to be like, oh, this is how many girls I've been with. Those bragging get, days are done. Like these yep. kids still try to live like what they see on TV. Kanye got a new yep. girl. I need a new girl. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I see <laughs> this, this rapper with, 30 girls around her, I need to be with 30 girls around me, you know, but yep. also, and I seen this in Honduras, 
the girls are becoming more adapt to where now they're playing the game. And I believe, oh, yeah. believe me, Marcus, in Honduras, I understood it because they're trying to make it. You know, they're trying to make it from Honduras to the United States. I they saw girls. I saw girls, Marcus, fine, dime pieces. I saw girls with dudes that if, if they were in the club in the United States, no girl would give them the time of day. No mm. girl at all. But these girls, they understood. I need to play yeah. the game too. Because why am I going to be out with a GQ dude when all he wants to do is get me in the bed? I ain't going to go nowhere with this. So they started flipping the script and was like, I need to play the game as well. You know what I'm saying? But the, the mentor is is definitely is non-existent, man. So these archetypes, where do you think they, they spur from? Like, are they from very beginning? Are they from their father, mother? Are they from the people they surround themselves with? Like, where did these womanizers, these baby boys, where did these come from? Because I know it can't just be like, all of a sudden, I'm this. You know what I'm saying? Well, it, I mean, generally... When a person, by the time a human being reaches five to seven years old, that personality is kind of set. And I think uh, most of these things come from uh, childhood trauma. And uh, as human beings, we all have coping mechanisms, right? We all, some people drink, some people smoke, some all people, right. you know, uh, overindulge in food, whatever. We all have coping mechanisms. So I, a lot of these, a coping mechanism is a way for you to deal with re your reality. And a lot of these things are just built to protect these guys. Let's take the take the womanizer for example. He didn't he at three years old he didn't he wasn't born a womanizer. He did he wasn't he didn't go around saying I'm gonna sleep with every woman I can sleep with until I can't sleep with him anymore. What he what he heard and what happened to him is something something clicked in his mind. He decided well I need to feel safe, and mm -hmm. the only way I can feel safe is be surrounded by feminine energy. I want and he found that oh sex feels good it's great I feel validated. You know, one scream my name, you know, she's having fun, I'm having fun. I feel validated. So usually, most of these archetypes come from flawed coping mechanisms. Um, instead of um, instead of drinking, you know, now a person may go to the gym. That's a good coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, right. the, the drinking was a flawed coping mechanism. So a lot of times these guys, are just, they just have bad coping mechanisms. They are codependent. Um, they are they're very 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 low self esteem and and it's all subconscious. It's all going on there subconscious, man. This is once you sit them down and talk to these guys and break mm -hmm. it down, you can pinpoint it. I can almost take it back to the moment. I talked to wow. the guy last week. Um, he was, I think he was, uh, ten years old. Had a crush on this girl, you know, got her flowers and candy and you know the things we used to do back in the day. And she laughed at him and said, "You know, I, I wouldn't date you. You got you made fun of his like skinny legs or something like these wow. my kids are." Yeah, yeah. Crushed him. Dude was like, "Never again. I ain't never gonna trust a girl ever again." And what he do? I hear smashing girls left and right. Got three, four kids by three, yeah. four different women. Wow. And you can almost go back to a point, but we're not designed mm -hmm. as a culture to we'll, we'll we'll accept it from a woman, but we won't accept it from a man. That we we have feelings, we get hurt. We have traumas. We rarely, we're just now a society starting to understand. That's why the male suicide rate's through the roof. Yeah. And that's why even amongst veterans, oh my goodness, the suicide rate's crazy. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we're taught that we're tough. Nothing can stop us. We can run through a brick wall and it didn't hurt me. All I could do, I could sit here at this bar and drink my problems away. That is what we're taught as veterans. And so I, I think a lot of these guys, just like just like us veterans who struggle, you know, on the other, on the other side of that uniform, mm -hmm. Is just bad coping mechanisms. That's crazy, man. I definitely agree with I, that. Go ahead, man. I was gonna say, yeah, I, d I definitely agree with that. With um, you know, we do have bad coping mechanisms. Like we're not taught that stuff. I mean, and going back to what you said even earlier, man. As soon as we get out of the military, and nobody talks about it all. Like, hey, by the way, you're gonna be mm -hmm. depressed, man. Like you're you're pretty much broke up with a like a, a partner in life. Like you broke up with like somebody. You lost somebody close to you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most and it's it's always it even boggles my mind to this day. Like we're, we're team people. We're always doing that. And as soon as we like as soon as that, that gate closes, that door closes on us, on our service, we go back to just one on one, you know, uh, it's me against the world. And it's like, nah, man, you put four or five of us together in a group, man, we can accomplish a lot of different things because just how we're how we're trained in, in those things. And, you know, I, I always say, like, I'll even say my, myself personally, like, you know, I tell people like my emotional maturity is like a five year old. 
I really don't have that much of a range of emotions or like that stuff. Why? A lot. It's not because, you know, I'm like Mr. Mr. Tubbs because I don't know how to deal with them in a sense, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I avoid things as well. And one of the things I found for me is a coping mechanism. And I've talked to my therapist about this is I've been in a feedback loop, a positive feedback loop where the more I work, the harder I go to do all those things. I do very well at work. So I've never had a problem with me overworking where somebody's in there saying, hey, by the way, that's not good. Like, it's always like, great. Uh, when I was civilian, you know, I mean, within two years, I had, I think, like four or five awards, you know, civilian of the year, civilian of the quarter, multiple times, and, you know, back to back type things. And it's like, there, there's never a point where someone sits there and tells you, hey, like, not by by working and not dealing with your problems, that's bad. Everyone's like, hey, good job if you work hard, right? right? Hard work, hard work works. Um, and so, I, you know, there's things I, I think as, as men, as we're evolving now, we have to start looking at something and saying, we can be tough, um, but we can't also, we can't like, we have to understand what's going on with us, but we can't break down. And, and one of the examples, like a very short one, like yesterday we had to put a cat down um, cause it was, you know, it was just, it was quality of life for our animal. It was quality of life was more important than how we felt. And so my daughter's like crying. She's like, just tear, like, you know, she's like bawling it's like one of those ones where you hear someone cry you start crying because it's so sad like it's just pure sadness right. and i had to just hold her and sit there and say it's okay to be sad right but i can't break down at that moment and stuff like that why because the family needs me we got to take care of these things and i think that's where men have a hard time understanding it's like you can be emotional you can be sad but okay like you at first you gotta make sure everyone's good and, and those things but you can still let people have emotion and so with that one, and, and I want to go back to what you talked about earlier when you broke down and started crying. You mentioned it like twice, so you broke down and cried. What do you think that was? And what kind of, um, like, how much better did you feel after that happened? Man, you said a whole mouthful there, man. Uh, uh, to answer your question, when I, when I broke those two times, it was because I hadn't been processing my emotions properly. And so... Um, I broke because my, there was nothing else left to do. If that, with designs, if, if there's a somebody that breaks into your house and they're trying to hurt your family, you know what you're going to do. You're willing to die mm -hmm. for your family. All of us are. I don't even have to ask you because I know. I can look in your eyes and tell. You'd be willing to die for your family. But we're mm -hmm. not taught to treat the little, I don't want to sound like a therapist here, but this is, a, this is something I use. There's a little boy inside of all of us. There's a little boy, little boy, he probably still has hair inside of me. <laughs> that has a little boy inside of all of you guys. We, mm -hmm. we, we're we taught to push him away. We never let the little boy out. We never let him go outside to play. We never let him, we because we got mad stuff to do. Well, you got to let the little boy out sometimes. And if you don't, he's going to force his way out. So in those times where I broke down, that was that little boy in me that was scared and couldn't say it. That was a little boy in me that wanted somebody to tell him it was going to be okay. To somebody to come rescue him because he's been rescuing everybody else. And so right. uh, if you if you can get to the point in your life and I'm, I'm getting there now, I'm still working, this is, I'm still a work in progress where I'm starting to let the little boy out. You know, I was doing a, a study with my family last last Sunday. Every Sunday uh, I do a study with my family. It could be biblical. It could be financial, whatever. And uh, my son wanted to talk he was talking about one of his friends where his uh, dad had uh, basically pushed him away because he was acting feminine. Um, and. I just, I, I told him, I said, guys, it doesn't matter what y'all do. Nothing could ever separate you from my love. Even if you are a serial killer, guess what I'm going to be every Sunday at the prison visiting my serial killer kid. I don't have to agree uh -huh. with your lifestyle to love you. And I, I start crying. I start crying because I, I couldn't imagine pushing one of my kids away because they were different or because they didn't do something uh -huh. the way I like to do it. And so my, my boys were kind of, my boys are 19 and 17. They're not, they're not kids. They're men. And my oldest is in college, and my older, my middle one's graduates in a few months. So they they were like, whoa. Both of them were just shook, like, oh, dad's crying. And my daughter, she basically started crying. You know, my wife. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. hard, you know. But it was like, like four tears came out of my face. But, you know, I and I had no shame. There's no shame in crying in front of your kids. I'm as manly as they come. But when it comes to my babies, I don't play. Yeah. And so uh, to answer your question, Mike, I think what we've done to ourselves as men is we painted ourselves into a corner. You know, we, we have all these expectations heaped on us from the world, from our spouses, from society, that this is the way, this is what a man is. And I think that we have to reevaluate that and look at masculinity in a different way. Now, 
I am in no stretch of imagination saying that you can wake up one day and call yourself a man. I don't, I don't rock with that. This is not what it is. You know, there is a process to becoming a man, and 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 to wake up and say I identify as this or that. I I can't rock with that. I just can't. No shade to nobody. No disrespect. But I can't rock with that because it's a process to get to where we are as men, and it's a lot of hurt, it's a lot of sweat, and a lot of tears to get there. So waking up and saying you're that, mm -mm, can't rock with it. Marcus, let me let me uh, ask you this one last thing, and because I really was like, whoa, when you revealed about the addiction to pornography, like mm -hmm. how how was that, man? Like, because honestly, like you know, we grow in Germany, we chilled and hang out and everything else. Like, I never would have saw that in you. You know what I'm saying? Because you're such an outgoing person. You're very sociable. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're 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 the way you presented yourself and everything, I would have never thought that that was a, even one of those demons that was following you or was with you and everything else. So talk to me about that, man, mm -hmm. because like, I mean, don't get me wrong. A lot of guys do it here and there and whatnot, but never yeah. to be yeah. to at the level of where you were at with it. Well, I mean, even in, in well, I didn't even realize it back then. Cause I asked Wayne. So uh, in the, in the book, I was, you, you know, I was, uh, I was uh, molested as a child. Uh, I didn't even really remember that until I got in my thirties to my late twenties, wow. early thirties. I remember the fact that I've been molested by a female babysitter. But if you remember when we lived in the Airman's at it, we had mm -hmm. tape, we had, you know, VHS yeah. tapes. And, and in my mind, I was thinking, oh, I'm single. You know, I really don't have a girl. Got to get this release. You know, when I get married, you know, I put it all down. No big deal. Well, when I got married, I couldn't stop. Wow. I couldn't stop. So I, I I was getting sex regularly. Obviously, I'm married, having mm -hmm. kids every other month, every other year, and I'm still I can't stop. I'm hiding it from my wife. I'm like, you know, this is back before the internet really was the internet. It was kind of right. had dial up, you know. I'm trying to yeah, yeah. <laughs> being clear my history, you know. The fact that you I, had VHS I, tapes. <laughs> <laughs> you got clear history, man. And so I'm, I'm, I'm like, it's becoming like a secret thing, man. And I don't like it because my wife and I have, have a great relationship and I've never hidden anything from, that was the one thing I hid, from, I hid from her for years. I hid that from her and I couldn't stop. I would try my best and I couldn't stop that. That's why I call it an addiction. Right. You know, like if it's something that you can't put down and walk away from in 30 seconds, that's a problem. My wife would go out Saturday or some shopping and it's, Two three hours just click 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 click. Yeah click, yeah. Click, click. You know, couldn't stop. And so that's why I call it an addiction. And back right. when we knew each other, we were just single dudes, man. That's what single yeah, dudes yeah. do. You know, no big deal. But it got to a point where I couldn't stop. That's where the addiction came in. It started to control me. And so uh, it was difficult. It was one of the hardest things I ever had to kick. But I'm so thankful I did. It, it just it, it, had, it was re actually rewiring my brain. And the way I view women, the way I view my my uh, sex in a marriage, like you know, hey man, look, hey, we married, bro. You getting you getting fifteen, you getting fifteen minutes of pure fun, and then we going to sleep, you know. But it, <laughs> it, it started it started like not being uh, enjoyable because I was watching all these images on TV, and then the more mm -hmm. I studied, uh, even when working my master's degree, I did a whole study on pornography and just seeing how it actually literally re rewires your brain. Um, changing your synapses and things like this very very dangerous and so uh i would advise any young man you know stay away from that crap you know if, if you can if you got to get your release you know do your thing but i for some people it, it really really messes them up and for me it just what happened that the the molestation coupled with the introduction mm. of pornography at eight nine ten wow. messed my brain up so yeah Really, send, really me, not, send, send, send me your list. <laughs> 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 send me send me the links over here. Now, but Marcus, man, it's I'm so I I'm super like I said, I was super stoked today, man. I'm so glad you said yes. I me and Mike have been talking about wanting to put, you know, guests on our platform and everything else. I really do appreciate you saying yes, coming on. I'm proud, proud, proud of all the things you have become as a man, as a father, 
you know, even, even as mentoring the young kids, even the men and everything else, like that is awesome, especially after all the adversity, the obstacles that you had to overcome, you know, to, to continue that faith. Because when bad things happen, a lot of people lose faith. They lose faith real quick. You know what I'm saying? They become weak and they just start asking why. Why is this happening to me? Why me? Why, why, won't, why can't I get a win here and there? But the fact that you and, you know, your wife have stuck through it, like you guys said, like you said, if we ate from cardboard, she was eating from cardboards with me. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, I know for sure that your kids definitely are happy that they have a father and a mother like you guys who are strong-willed, you know, open communication, being there for them if they have any issues and everything. Because you don't see that in a lot of parents nowadays. You know, that communication is not open. You know, if your son has an issue with a girl, I'm sure he could come up to you and say, hey, dad or hey, mom, can we talk about this? You know what I'm saying? But some parents, they don't have that. It's just like they're scared to go to mom and dad because mom and dad is going to see it as why did you do that or punishment? You know what I'm saying? Or I need it. Now they're going to get disciplined or whatnot. But I'm really grateful that you came on. Um, I'm glad that you, you did this. And I know you're doing some of your own stuff. So do me a favor, plug in your stuff. Like, what do you got going on? I know you have Meet the Simmons and everything else, but let our, let our viewers and listeners know what you have going on so they could continue following after hopefully they listen to this episode and this narrative of yours. It's truly remarkable, dude, because I, I thought I knew you. You know what I'm saying? Like, we were together and everything else, but yeah, there's, there's certain things that we divulge to each other and everything else that we let people know about us. But sometimes we just don't open that door fully wide open. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm glad that you did. For those who haven't read it, read it, cop it. It's on Amazon. It's it's remarkable because, like I said, it's your truest, purest self that you really laid out on that pen and paper. You know what I'm saying? Like, that truly was you and you didn't hide nothing, man. Like, I, you know, things that you, that other people won't really talk about, you just let it out there, which is what, as a reader... I'm, sh I'm sure other readers really appreciate it because I like when it's just real. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't fluff. Don't just beat around the bush. Like, just keep it 100. You know what I'm saying? I, and I, I'm glad that you did that. Sure. I, I hope, like you said, for your second book, if you're working on it, do so. Let me know when it comes out and everything else because I'm definitely looking forward to another one. But go ahead and plug your stuff, man. Like, what do you got going on? What other projects you got going on? Cool. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, Mike. Thank you guys so much for having me on, man. Mike. Good to meet you, man. I love your spirit, man. You just, I just see a good dude when I see you. I, I know a good man when I see it, man. I, I got a lot of respect for you. Izzy, you know you're my brother, man. Always will be. My Puerto Rican brother. Go to song. I, I got plenty, we got <laughs> plenty of stories. We gonna do, I got plenty of stories, but yes. uh, anybody that needs yes. to link up with us, uh, you can find us on Instagram. We are Meet the, meet the Simmons 1. Uh, if you go to Meet the Simmons, there's another couple there way better looking and way younger, but that's not us. <laughs> meet the Simmons 1. Is us. Uh, you can find us on uh, also on Facebook at Meet the Simmons. Um, you can find our books on Amazon. My book is a project, unapologetically masculine, masculinity black toxicity. Uh, my wife's book is Incredible Me: Memoirs of an Invisible Girl. Very good read. Her life story, her determined times in the military, things she went through as a woman. Great read for young ladies, even young men, but definitely for young ladies. A great read. Um, and also look for us in the next three months to open our life coaching services, Better You Life Coaching Services. Uh, we will be doing that. We are not certified life coaches. So if you want a session, just inbox me, uh, Facebook or Instagram, and we'll set some up very affordable. And uh, we do masculinity coaching, femininity coaching, and couples coaching. So that's us. Yeah, man, that's dope, man. I'm so, like, again, when Izzy was telling me, it's like, man, he's an author. It's like, that's that's dope as shit. And the reason why I say that is, like, like we were talking before we even started recording, man, there's some veterans that whatever they, when they got out, that's the pinnacle their, their life will ever be. And that's for them, they're going to live in that, that that you know, they're going to live in that videotape every day. Um, and so I love seeing that, man, there's veterans that get out and they can do other things. Because, again, there's so many more skills we have. There's so many more things. You have a life experience. The military didn't teach you or didn't have anything to do with it. But you can still utilize the things that you you were you were taught, trained how to do to help other people. And I truly believe that once, you know, especially for us veterans, we, we you know, we hate getting out because we forgot we lost our mission. And once we figure out our mission, which I generally believe most of us is helping people, 
you'd be surprised, man. You can you can do so much more good in this world if you just help people out and if you can use your experiences of what you're doing. And especially what you're talking about, like going from there, even the point of like having one eye for that time and having to type like that. That's just sure will. And, you know, that discipline to stick with it and go there. And I, I'm so happy that you're doing those things. I hope you write another book. Um, I was watching your your, your stuff on Facebook where you and your wife. It made me laugh because there was a part where you're talking about um, I think it was like a 37 year old woman beat like 11 year old kid because she was bullying that somebody. And just the idea of like sitting there saying, by the way, the kid's 11. Like you having to put that into perspective uh, for, for those things. It was just like, right. And what I loved about what you were doing on Facebook, it was real. It wasn't like there was a light, there's production, there's like a script. It was you and your wife having a conversation. I think even during that one, she got like a little, real, like a little upset because, you know, like, you know, that mother, mama bear <laughs> thing like that, but it's real and it's genuine. And so when people are meeting you on Facebook live and you're meeting your things, which you'll be putting on some on YouTube and those things, they'll really get a chance to meet you. And I think that's really imperative yeah. for people to understand when it comes to relationships as, as a man, as a woman, you gotta be who you are. And if you're not comfortable in your own skin, you're not genuine in who you are then you're really not. So again, man, so glad to see, glad, glad you came on, man. So glad you're doing those things. And man, look forward to seeing what else you do and to help the world out. Appreciate you, man. Look forward to working with you guys and collabing. You guys got something special here. There's, some, there's something really special about this, man. And uh, I'm going to pub it, support it, do everything I can in my power. Tell all time my boys on to it because you guys are doing a great service, man. There's not a lot of places where veterans can sit out and talk about and talk openly and not have to explain everything, right. you know, PCS, what does that mean? You know, like, just, just actually, just yeah, yeah. Talk, you know, and really, really just catch up with, catch up with old buddies, man. So I, I love this. I told my wife about it. So you guys can look for some few, few more subscribers in the next few, few weeks because we're going to really push this out. But I appreciate you guys so much for the opportunity, man. All right, Marcus, uh -huh. uh, we're going to, we'll talk more offline, all right? Yeah, definitely.